Okay, chapter one, section two, cultural core and periphery, the problem of liberation. Since the end of the 1960s, as a fruit of the emergence of critical Latin American social science, particularly dependency theory, and that's a, that's a continuation of developmentalism and uh, uh, development in Latin America, dependency theory, uh, and, and gets at this notion that Latin American countries are dependent on the US empire and on Europe, uh, dependent politically and economically and trying to uh, break that dependence uh, and uh, and of course the way that especially the American uh, the North American Empire uh, used development to to cause political economic dependency in Latin American co countries on purpose uh, as a fruit of the emergence of critical Latin American social science, as well as the uh, as the Emmanuel Levinas's lecture "Totality and Infinity," and perhaps initially and principally as a result of the popular and student movements of 1968 worldwide, but fundamentally in Argentina and Latin America, a historical rupture was produced in the field of philosophy, and consequently in philosophy of culture uh, that he was primarily interested in. So 68 was a worldwide youth revolution. We experienced it in the United States, uh, but, um, but Argentina uh, in Latin America and Brazil, it was really heavy. Uh, it was uh, quite uh, a stir. Uh, this Levinas lecture, Totality and Infinity, he's gonna ruminate uh, throughout uh, he's going to ruminate upon throughout the rest of the, the entire book here to do so, the, the, the anti-Cartesian meditations. Um, okay, so uh, what had previously considered, what had been previously considered the metropolitan and colonial worlds were now categorized through the still developmentalist terminology of Raul Priebisch of the uh, CEPAL, as a core and periphery. Okay, there's the, the core um, of especially the United States and the periphery of Latin America and other underdeveloped uh, countries. To this, we should add an entire categorical horizon originating in critical economics, which demanded the incorporation of social classes as intersubjective actors to be integrated into a definition of culture. Okay, categorical, categorical horizon is when you like create, you know, you kind of draw out a category and, and say, okay, here's the boundary lines uh, of a certain category so that it becomes, you know, visible and conceptually conscious in our minds. Uh, critical economics, Marxist economics, which, uh, wanted to talk about social class and the class antagonisms and that these classes are actually agents, actors in history. They're not entirely dependent on the saviors from the core. Um, this was not merely a terminological question, but a conceptual one, which allowed for the rupturing of the substantialist conception of culture and for the discovery of fractures internal to each culture and between them, not only as an intercultural dialogue or clash, as he had been using the terminology, but rather more strictly as domination and exploitation of one culture over others. Domination, exploitation. It was necessary to take into account on all levels the asymmetry of the actors involved. Uh, symmetry is when things are balanced. So, symmetry, especially in power relationships, is when you have equal power. So, like when you have a war, a real war, there's two armies 
and you don't know who's going to win. That's what makes it a genuine uh, war. Uh, but when you have asymmetry, when you have the United States and, uh, you know, the Taliban, the United States has this superiority that, that's an asymmetric, unbalanced superiority. And, uh, and then this is what is called asymmetric warfare, which means that then the weaker power uses unconventional means to uh, erode the power of the supervening power. Um, so it was necessary to take into account on all levels the asymmetry, asymmetry of the actors involved, that there was the powerful and the relatively powerless, but that doesn't make them totally without agency of their own and the ability to act maybe unconventionally. The culturalist stage was over. Thus, in 1983, in a chapter entitled Beyond Culturalism, I wrote, from the structuralist view of culturalism, it was impossible to understand the changing situation of hegemony within the well-defined historical blocks and in respect to the ideological foundations of diverse classes and factions. Moreover, culturalism lacked the categories of political society in the last analysis, the state, and civil society. Okay. So political society, civil society. Uh, Latin American philosophy, like the philosophy of liberation, discovered its cultural conditioning since it understood itself from the perspective of a determinate culture, Europe, but moreover it was articulated explicitly or implicitly, implicitly from the perspective of the interest of determinate classes, groups, genders, races, etc. Location had been discovered and was the first philosophical theme to be addressed. Intercultural dialogue had lost its simplicity and came to be understood as overdetermined by the entirety of, col of the colonial era. Uh, overdetermination, uh, over overdetermination is when you see a phenomenon and you might explain it in more than one way, uh, explain its causes in more than one way, and you know there could be five different causes, and they could all be pushing things in the same direction. That's called overdetermination. So it isn't just one thing that causes it, but it's a whole chorus of causes uh, working in concert. Uh, in fact, in 1974, we initiated an intercontinental South-South dialogue, not North-South, but South-South dialogue between thinkers from Africa, Asia, and Latin America whose first meeting was held in Dar es Salaam, uh, Tanzania in 1976. Those encounters gave us a new and immediate pro, uh, panorama of the great cultures of humanity. Okay, so this is Latin American, African, etc. cetera, um, cross-cultural dialogue, not even worrying about the United States and Europe. This new vision of, cultural, uh, of culture emerged at the last of these meetings, which took place at the University of El Salvador in Buenos Aires, at which point the philosophy of liberation was already fully in development. Okay, so here, philosophy of liberation is fully formed. It represented a frontal attack on the position of Domingo F. Sarmiento, an eminent Argentinian educator and author of uh, Facundo, Civilization o Barbarie, um, Civilization or Barbarism. From him, civilization meant, for him, civilization meant North American culture, and barbarism was represented by the uh, federal cadillos that struggled for regional autonomy against the port of Buenos Aires, the transmission belt of English domination. My critique was the beginning of a demythologization of the national heroes who had conceived the neo-colonial model in Argentina, which had already begun to run out of steam. An, an imperial culture, that of the core, 
which originated with the invasion of America in 1492, confronted the peripheral cultures in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe. The result was not a symmetrical dialogue, but rather one of domination, of exploitation, of annihilation. Right? So when you have this asymmetry of power and you have cross-cultural dialogue, it's not on the same basis of power. And so North America culture dominates, exploits, and annihilates Latin American culture. Moreover, the elites of these peripheral cultures were educated by the imperialists. And therefore, as Jean-Paul Sartre wrote in the preface to Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, echoed what they had learned in Paris or London. Enlightened neo-colonial elites, these are uh, neo-colonial elites born in Latin America or Africa or Indonesia, etc., were so loyal to the empires that they distanced themselves from their own people and used them like hostages for their dependent politics. Therefore, there were asymmetries of domination on the world map. A, a Western metropolitan and Eurocentric culture, the civilization of Ricoeur, that dominated and sought to annihilate all peripheral cultures. Okay, so that's the main Eurocentric Anglo-American uh, culture. On the other end, there's post-colonial cultures, Latin America from from beginning of the 19th century in Asia and Africa following the Second World War, which were themselves split between one, groups associated with the current empires, enlightened elites who, whose authority required them to turn their backs on their ancestral re, uh, regional culture, and two, the popular majority settled in their, in their traditions which they defended often in a fundamentalist manner against the imposition of technocratic, economically capitalist culture. Okay, so we have the dominant core culture, uh, Euro culture, the post-colonial cultures coming out of colonialism in Latin America, Africa, Asia, but then we have elites in these post-colonial cultures that are beholden to Euro culture and distinguish themselves from their own people by being slavishly Eurocentric and kowtowing and promoting the interests of the capitalist core, the bourgeois core. But then on the other hand, in these post-colonial cultures, you have the popular majority. Uh, this is their own people. Okay, so this is gonna be important uh, because as, the, as we will see, Dussel develops this notion of the people into the Puebla. And then he, he makes certain distinctions and he wants to really analyze populism and, and um, and this is what I was talking about when I was reading the Communist Manifesto. Uh, here he's kind of refashioning the proletariat of the Communist Manifesto into the Puebla of liberation philosophy, the philosophy of liberation. And so this then is the most important cultural unit for Dussel is this number two here, the popular majority. Philosophy of liberation as a critical cultural philosophy needed to generate a new elite whose enlightenment would be integrated with the interest of the social block of the oppressed, uh, Gramsci's popolo. Uh, Gramsci was a, an Italian Marxist at the beginning of the 20th century. For that reason, we spoke of the liberation of popular culture. Okay, liberation of popular culture uh, that kind of has a postmodernist feel to it because when we talk about pop culture, it's like pop music, like 
like even K-pop is referring to popular culture. Uh, pop music is popular cultural music. Movies and television and magazines, all this kind of ephemeral uh, nowadays, uh, social media, Instagram, etc. This is all popular culture, which uh, from this Eurocentric view was seen as less than, but then in the late 1960s, that began to be inverted so that more and more popular culture from a Eurocentric perspective, popular culture began to be uh, considered as authentic culture. And so this phrasing liberation of popular culture has some problems for Dussel, which he will kind of sort out as we go through this. Uh, so we spoke of the liberation of popular culture. There is firstly a patriotic revolution of national liberation. Secondly, a social revolution that liberates the oppressed classes. And thirdly, there is a cultural revolution. The last of these operates on the pedagogical level, the level of youth, the level of culture. Okay, and this 1968 experience certainly influenced that, yeah. That peripheral culture oppressed by the imperial culture should be the point of departure for intercultural, intercultural dialogue. We wrote in 1973, the culture of cultural poverty, far from being a minor culture, represents the most uncontaminated and irradiative core of the resistance of the oppressed against the oppressor. In order to create something new, one must have a new word that burst in from the exteriority. This exteriority is the people itself, which despite being oppressed by the system, is totally foreign to it. Okay, so here, popular culture um, can invent new ideas out of the vast majority of the populace who are not Eurocentric intellectuals, but just like good old fashioned entertainment and whatnot. But these can create new categories which, which, uh, with which Latin American culture can fight against cultural repression from the core. Okay, the project of cultural liberation arises from popular culture, although thought through the philosophy of liberation in the Latin American context. We had overcome culturalist developmentalism that believed that a traditional culture would be able to transition into a secular pluralist culture. However, it was still necessary to radicalize our misguided analysis of the popular sector. Lo popular, the best, right? Pop and cool, being cool. Since it is the womb of the late, uh, since it is in the womb of the latter, uh, contains the nucleus that would harbor populism and fundamentalism, the worst. Another step would be necessary. Okay, so he's indicating here that this original inspiration of popular culture rooted in 1968, and uh, there was a movement in, in France, the situationalists, who really seized on uh, popular culture and postmodernist combinations and juxtapositions of of classical with with pulp, uh, you know, mundane, everyday ephemera, in order to actually promote the '68 revolution in Paris and elsewhere. Um, that sort of spread throughout. Uh, the entire youth movement of the late 1960s. And Dussel is indicating here that, you know, maybe he got sucked into that a little bit too much without making a critical distinction that's very necessary because the popular can become the reactionary in Marx and Engels' term. You know, there is a certain class of people who are part of the people, the vast majority, who are part of the underclass, however you define that, but who have reactionary tendencies that can be used as tools to go try to unwind the revolution, to go backwards in history. And, and of course, in the United States, in, in um, 
in 2021, in January of 2021, we saw a group of populist reactionaries storm uh, the United States Capitol and try to undermine the election. Um, you know, that, that was a turning point in American history. If they had have succeeded, we would be in a very different place today. That, that just happened to not quite be as bad as it could have been. Uh, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of danger that, that, that lurks within lo popular, you know, the, what is cool and hip and popular at the moment and captures the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the times, uh, it can be manipulated in, in strange directions, and in particular from a revolutionary perspective uh, that Dussel has, lo popular can be used to try to undo the revolution, to undo progressive uh, socialistic uh, revolution and, and try to go backwards in time to protect the interests of elites. You know, on January 6th, we had relatively poor, uneducated um, people protecting the interests of, of uh, well-educated, well-heeled, you know, rich elites and trying to entrench those interests uh, of the Republican Party and, and the more reactionary uh, segments of the, the Democratic Party as well. Because both of these parties uh, have strong reactionary um, conservative elements. Okay. <clears throat> 